this time, I'll call the January 21st, 2021, hard to believe, meeting of the Metro Sports Authority to order. It is our opinion that the items on today's agenda constitute essential business of this body and the meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare in, of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Are there any objections? Today's meeting is being live streamed by Metro ITS on Metro Network One. I'm saddened to have to share the the news of the recent passing of former Sports Authority board member Judge Steve North, who faithfully served on this board from 2002 until 2013. I will always remember Judge North as a passionate public servant and will miss running into him and Joanne at the Titans games. We are grateful for his service and our thoughts are with his family at this time. I'll ask the board to let us know if you are here. And hopefully we won't have you this morning. Kathy Bender. Present. Emmett Wynn. Present. Margaret Bim. Present. Don Deering. Here. Chad Duncan. Glenn Farner. I'm here. Melvin Gill. Present. Don Glassmeyer. Frank Harrison. Here. Dan Hogan. Dan is getting back on. Okay. When um, I'll look for his name and acknowledge when he is able to join us back on. Aaron McGee. Anna Page. Doesn't look like Dan has joined us just yet, but Monica, if you'll keep us posted so we can acknowledge his presence. The chair detects the quorum, so we will move through our agenda. Um, on Friday, the board received the meeting minutes from our November 19th, 2020 meeting. At this time, we would entertain a motion to approve. This is Glenn Farner. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, Glenn. Is there a second? Second. Second. Second by Emmett Wynn and others. Any discussion? Please vote when I call your name on regarding approval of the meeting minutes from November. Kathy Bender. Kathy. I approve. Emmett. Wynn. Approve. Margaret Bell. Aye. John Daring. Aye. Glenn Farner. Aye. Melvin Gill. Yes. Frank Harrison. Frank, can you vote on the meeting minutes? Are you there? Okay. 
Okay, we'll move on. I don't think, oh, Dan, are you on? I am. Thank you for joining back up. How do you vote on the meeting approval of the minutes? Aye. Thank you. And Kim, I'm here as well. Quentin fixed me. I was showing as an attendee, not a panelist. So I am here and I vote yes. Thank you, John Glassmeyer. The minutes are approved. Um, Chair, I want to acknowledge my attendance, Aaron McGee. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. We have you noted as present. Madam Chair, this is Frank Harrison. Did you call my name? Yes, sir, I did. I you... didn't hear it, but um, I vote yes. Thank you, Frank. We will reflect. You also voted affirmative for the minute, minutes. They are approved. And at this time, we will hear from our executive director, Monica Funknot, to give her report. Monica? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us today. You have the agenda before you. Following my report, will receive the Women's Professional Sports Ad Hoc Committee report from, um, from the chair, Kathy Bender and also the report on debt obligations uh, related to the MLS stadium revenue bonds. Um, and then following those reports, the board will receive updates on each of our facilities. It's been a while since we've um, been able to, to hear from our facilities and, and there's a lot going on. So um, that, will, that will take up the majority of our agenda. We also will conclude agenda item 10 with board elections um, as required by our bylaws annually every January. Are there any questions about the agenda? I think I lost audio. Monica, can you hear me? I hear you. Can you hear me? I'll continue. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention briefly is that budget season is um, has started. It's upon us. Yesterday we received a memo from the from the finance department. Um, FY twenty two budget submissions are due on February fifteenth. Um, the next board meeting is February eighteenth. And, and so that means that as we've done in the past, we will present the budget to the Hello. board. Kim, we can hear you. Can you hear us? We'll present the we'll present the budget to the board. We will ask you all to ratify that. And it, it's it's just a matter of timing. But I wanted to give you a heads up on that. The finance committee will need to meet in February. Um, so that we can address our department operating budget and, and some other items as well. Are there any any questions? If not, that concludes my report. I think our chair is struggling with with audio. Um, can the vice chair, Kathy, can you take over? Yes, uh, Monica. Um, thank you for that executive director's report, and hopefully our chair will be back on shortly. Next on hey, the agenda. Hey, I lost audio. <laughs> um, it looks like I'm on. Should I log out and go back in? Oh, you can. I can't hear anyone else. Great. Okay. Can you hear me, Madam Chair? Okay, so while our chair is getting back on, we'll continue with the meeting. Next on the agenda is the Women's Pro Sports Ad Hoc Committee Report, which I am uh, serving as chair, so I'll, I will give that report. Um, the Women's Professional Ad Hoc Committee met this morning. In light of the board approval for the Ad Hoc Committee to move forward, Invitations to bid went out in November, and we received three responses, one from CAA Icon, one from Sports Value Consulting, and one from Conventions and Sports Leisure. 
The committee discussed options of selecting from one of those three providers who responded or moving forward with the Metro procurement process. After some very engaging dialogue, we unanimously agreed to move forward with both the market survey and the economic fiscal analysis going through the procurement process of Metro, noting that they can both be addressed together or separately. And uh, that concluded our meeting. And uh, I don't know if Margaret or if you or Dan have comments around this morning's meeting. I'm, I'm happy just to add, Kathy, that uh, our advisory committee members were there, uh, and uh, it's always good to have them. It's so helpful, and Michelle Lane and Margaret Darby were very helpful in guiding us. Uh, one thing that you as chair and Kim Atkins as chair of the authority uh, uh, made sure to emphasize was the commitment to the purposes of this committee, but we also, and the timing we discussed, but we really wanted to make sure that we followed the procedures that everyone had confidence in what we were doing and look down the road uh, uh, to have a, a good process, uh, even though it might take a little longer. So uh, I think Dan and I enjoyed the meeting as long as in addition to you, I think it was a good meeting and I think we're on a good path. Thank you so Margaret. I concur with all those comments. We're always happy to have our um, community partners uh, participate in our meetings and any board members are always welcome. So uh, we do appreciate that we had great attendance this morning and a lot of input from a lot of different sources. Metro Legal and Metro Finance, uh, we always appreciate your presence as well. Um, so with that, that concludes my report, and I think our chair is back on. Thank you. So maybe she's not. Um, so next on the agenda, we have the presentation of State Form CT-2. 0253, the report on debt obligations. Monica is going to kick this off for us, and then we're going to hear from uh, Michelle Bosch, Metro Legal. Thanks, Kathy, and I'm back up now. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. So what you're looking at on the screen and, and what you also received um, last Friday in your board materials is the report on debt obligation. The purpose of the report is to provide clear and concise information about the debt we recently issued, um, the MLS stadium revenue bonds to the board. Um, the, the report must be prepared for all debt obligations issued by any public entity and then it has to be filed with the governing body, which would be the sports authority, with a copy sent to the comptroller of the treasury for the state. And that has also been done. Um, so pursuant to TCA section 921151, you are um, hereby presented with the debt report. Um, I think that Michelle Bosch, our treasurer, is on um, as as the vice chair said, and I know Margaret Darby is here. Margaret, would you like to add anything to that? This is Margaret and Monica. I think you covered it brilliantly. You have stated exactly what needs to be done. The report has been filed with the comptroller and now it has been uh, presented to the local issuing authority and um, all steps have been completed. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on at this time, we will hear from the MLS Stadium group for their update. And I believe Ian Ayer will start this off. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, I believe you guys are gonna drive the slides for me. Um, I think we were starting actually with uh, the team update.
Yeah, two slides ahead of those. Yeah, we need to go back a little. Uh, uh, the other way. Thank you. Um, so uh, in a little while, I'll hand off to uh, uh, CAI kind of going to share some exciting progress on our stadium, but I thought we'd start by taking a look back at our first year in MLS and, and as requested, particularly look at some of our community work. And um, this first slide um, really captures what was day one for us in MLS. Um, and what better way to start our journey in MLS than doing something uh, in the community. And this image was from the day of our first game, that opening game on February 29th, when in the morning of that game, we launched the planting of 100 trees uh, in the community in and around the stadium. And the um, picture here captures you know, our ownership group, myself and our, um, our commissioner from MLS, who was in town for the game, uh, and, our, and our opponents that day, Atlanta United, a really great way to start. And, and we were really excited about kicking off the whole journey with something in the community. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, and that continued throughout our year. As everybody knows, we had that incredible opening day with almost 60,000 people at Nissan Stadium. And, and then unfortunately, just a day or so after, um, the city was hit by a tornado. And then subsequently, we went into this world we all live in now with COVID. But it was great for us and particularly rewarding for us as a team to see that the, the roster of players we'd assembled and our staff uh, we're hugely supportive of being active in the community around these events and some great images here. And we were, we were able to launch a tornado relief fund ourselves. Um, and uh, those of you who were at the game when we opened will remember we had our own anthem written by a local band. Um, it's called Never Give Up On You by, by uh, Judah and the Lion. And, and it really felt very apt just a day or so after started that you know not giving up on our community and this was fantastic we the yellow circle there was a patch we developed which was on our jerseys for the next game which is away in portland and and portland timbers themselves also supported us with a donation and then moving into the covid world uh we were able over the year to, to raise over a hundred thousand dollars uh between ourselves and our, our support at, at ingram Industries. so Fantastic year, really. Uh, going to the next slide, please. Uh, and as the year moved on, uh, as many of you know, we, we, we were a lot of us, a lot of organizations involved in, um, in initiatives together and showing the strength, I think, of Nashville across the board and donating 10,000 masks for COVID-19 to, to, to communities. And then also um, donations with other partners uh, generating over $50,000 of donations ourselves uh, for displaced workers working in the city. So again, a great way. And soccer was hard to come by. It was great to be able to do stuff in the community. Uh, and then towards the end of the year, we really focused on a couple of big initiatives. Um, our, our partnership with Pencil uh, and Metro Public Schools was fantastic. Again, players and staff involved, but really launching the literary, literacy initiative, which which has been really well taken up and, and we feel very proud of that. And then also around Thanksgiving, working with Metro Police to deliver uh, meals for Thanksgiving uh, to challenge families in the Edge Hill community. So a great way. And then finishing off the year, we, um, we entered into a, a, a partnership with the T Tennessee Immigrants and Refugee Rights Coalition and um, some of you may recall way back in late 2019, we launched our first mini pitch at the Madrid Center in North Nashville. And this initiative is putting in place the second of those near the, the Rights Commission Coalition's headquarters in Antioch. And, and again, it's going to be a great product that we can help serve the community with and you know, give kids in that community an opportunity to be um, surrounded by our, our sport of soccer. And then on the next slide, please. So just to summarize that year in looking back, um, I think as a, you know, effectively we're really a startup team in 
probably the most the most challenging year I think of any MLS team joining a new league. But to say that whilst we were able to achieve a lot on the field in the end, you know, we, we reached the semi-final of the playoffs conference, which is incredible for our first year. But we feel equally as proud as being able to achieve these metrics in our first year for the community with over $250,000 raised and 500 hours of community service. I think it says a lot about where we want to head as an organization and um, and we were grateful for all the support that we had from, from other people and other organizations working in tandem with us. And then moving on to the next slide, just taking a look forward. Um, you know, this is an important time for us, particularly on the soccer side of it. Um, we've just this week reintroduced testing and other protocols to bring our players back to training and back to training facilities um, and establishing some movements in our roster. Today is actually, uh, this afternoon is the day of our super draft. Uh, and so we will get, it's kind of equivalent, if you like, to the college draft in, in football. Um, so that's a, a big day for us. And we have three or four picks to make there uh, in, this afternoon in that, in that um, event. So looking forward to that. And then also excited to see that the roster we assembled um, has attracted, you know, interest in a couple of our players um, to play for their national team. So Walker Zimmerman uh, called up in, in recent weeks to play for the U.S. national team. Uh, and Alistair Johnson, uh, one of our younger players and somebody we took in the draft last year, uh, being called up to the Canadian national team. So that tells us we're headed in the right direction in terms of players and, and feel good about that. Um, and then really looking forward to our stadium. And as I said, uh, Kellen from CA Icon will talk about the facility in a minute. But what an exciting period for us. We we started our sale of 2021 season tickets for, for, for Nissan. Uh, I have to say we've seen great growth in that, 10% uh, growth, and not really um, putting that out there until we get the official start date. So, so good to see that level of growth uh, even before we really start our marketing push. And then, as some of you will have seen, we've seen a, a great launch of our premium products for the new stadium um, with our Lowe's boxes selling out completely within 48 hours and really only a handful of new stadium suites remaining now. So really positive. And the premium club went on sale in recent days. And again, we've seen a similar level of anticipation and interest and, and lots of sales there. So feeling good about where we're headed with the new stadium. Um, and without further ado, I think that's the right time to hand over to Kellen, who can give us a look at some of the exciting developments in the construction area. All right. Thank you, Ian. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so a lot has happened on the project in the last two months since we've provided an update. The stadium is still on schedule and the construction crews are continuing to ramp up on the project. We are now at approximately 250 craft workers on site. Uh, we are pleased to report that after six months under construction, we are injury free on the project. Uh, you could stay on that slide. That'd be fine. Um, the one, the aerial photo, uh, one more up there. On the aerial photo of the screen, you'll see here that was taken over a week and a half ago. You can really see the progress on the project. At the end of November, we wrapped up the mass excavation of the project for the lower bowl and the south service level. A total of approximately 400,000 cubic yards of rock and soil were hauled off to create the pitch in lower bowl. The stadium construction sequence has been focused on the critical path of the project, which is the south service level. This area of, of, uh, to the bottom of the screen is where the locker rooms and back house functions will be located. You'll see that we've been pouring the concrete slab on grade in this service area, and we just completed the final pour yesterday. The flow of construction activities on the project moves clockwise around the stadium from the south. On the west side of the project, we have completed all of our underground MEPs and all the concrete foundations have been poured. We have just started to pour the first portions of the concrete slabs on grade for the concourse and the first portions of the lower seating bowl have also started to be poured on the west. On the north side of the stadium, all of the underground MEPs have been completed and the concrete foundation work has started. And then lastly, on the east side of the stadium, which is to the right of the image here, all the underground MEP and utility installations have been installed and concrete foundation work is getting started. Uh, the past six months of construction has been a push to make way for the upcoming 
major milestone of starting structural steel erection. The large crawler crane for erecting the steel showed up on site yesterday, and we plan to start setting the first portions of steel later next week. And then also for a COVID update, um, two months ago, when we last provided an update on the project, we had a total of five reported COVID cases among the craft workers. Um, as of this week, there have been a total of 10 positive cases reported on the project overall through the past six months. Um, if you'll turn to the next slide here, I just want to show some close-up photos of some of the major elements of the stadium. Um, the upper left-hand photo here is our first slab on grade pour for the, con uh, the concourse, the restrooms and concession stands. And then the upper middle photo here, you'll start to see the uh, west side lower bowl um, stadia on grade. And then on the upper right-hand corner, this is the uh, southwest corner kick terrace is one of the premium products that uh, Ian was speaking about. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see the uh, slab on grades that have been poured. That will be where the locker rooms are located. And then on the bottom right-hand side, you'll start to see some of the, uh, the treads and risers for this um, west side stadium on grade, which is where, where the club seating will be. So um, we're excited to share the progress and um, looking forward to sharing more in next month's update. Um, are there any questions on the construction before I turn it over to Carol Greenlee? If not, uh, Carol will provide an update on our DBE participation. Good morning. This is Carol. Um, what you see on the screen is our update for uh, SNWDE participation and workforce. Uh, as a reminder, the DBE goal for this project is 30%. Currently, DBE participation is at 37%. Um, this translates into 80 DBE firms awarded approximately $68 plus million of work. Uh, we've also provided a breakdown of DBE participation by category. 37 firms uh, are WBEs, 33 firms are MBEs, and 10 firms are SBEs. Again, the majority of our DBE firms are located here in Tennessee. And of those that are located in Tennessee, 21 are right here in Davidson County. 54 are in Tennessee. The other remaining uh, 80 is in uh, outside of the state. Lastly, we want to provide an update on our workforce uh, diversity goal. Mortis and Messer voluntarily established a workforce goal of 22% combined women and people of color on the project. Through December, project hours total 96,981. We are tracking the participation by the, the a number of hours worked on the project. The hours worked by women and people of color is at 36,500, which represents 38% of workforce utilization. We are gonna to continue to look for ways to increase this percentage by staying engaged with local workforce development organizations to ensure workforce needs are met, communicated as well as other um, prime contractors needs are met on the project as, as the work progresses uh, throughout the coming year. Any questions? If not, I'll turn yes. to Excuse me, uh, Melvin Gill. Yes, sir. Uh, I have uh, questions with reference to every time I see uh, this breakdown, I'm, I'm curious about uh, the women owned business participation. <clears throat> and uh, for a construction industry, and of course, I might still be in Jurassic Park when this is where this is concerned, but for the construction industry, I am interested in knowing how Nashville. Uh, how this project is able to have such a large percentage of women-owned participation in an industry that has uh, historically been a male-dominated uh, industry with with images of of uh, 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 individuals with uh, picks and shovels, hammers and saws, jackhammers, heavy equipment, and what have you. So I'm interested in knowing. 
uh, how many of these women-owned businesses uh, were well-established, long-established businesses that were acquired, uh, perhaps for the purposes of of uh, pursuing opportunities and benefits that were in the beginning uh, primarily uh, uh, intended for uh, the socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. Um, is there a way to get a listing of uh, the businesses, their profiles, uh, whether they were uh, women-owned businesses that were started by women, uh, whether they were, whether they are businesses that were well established, and somehow the ownership was uh, acquired, transferred, or however done uh, for the purposes of uh, of uh, taking advantage of opportunities and benefits that were primarily uh, for the benefit of uh, socially and economically disadvantaged uh, firms. Is, is there a way to, is there a way to get a breakdown of a list of firm, women-owned firms in, in such a manner? Uh, some, of the, some of the information that, that you are asking for, we will have to get that from their certification uh, information. <laughs> Um, we could look into digging even deeper uh, into um, uh, some of the the the, inf the information that you're interested in, um, and get back with you uh, with what we can gather on that information. But to give you some indication <laughs> as to the length of time, um, most of the certifications um, that we see come through. And we verify uh, a lot of these companies have to be in business at least a year. Uh, that's the minimum to be certified. And they all are certified through uh, other agencies <coughs> around the state, around the country, and also uh, locally. But we can um, look into getting you more information into uh, relating to their profiles. Well, I, I would like to, uh, if at all possible, get that information. And I'm, I'm not necessarily concerned. Well, I, I guess the length of time that a business has been in existence and not necessarily um, having been certified. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I'd like to give two examples on uh, some of the reasons uh, that, uh, a couple of the reasons that I'm interested in this. Uh, several years ago, I was in a meeting with... Uh, a well-established firm, uh, and there were uh, several uh, women partners in the firm. And I was told specifically that they were becoming, they were planning to become a women-owned firm. And I asked why, and they said so they could take advantage of the opportunities uh, uh, that are out there for uh, SMWBE businesses. And my response was that you are a well-established firm, highly competitive in the marketplace. And when you um, become a women-owned business, one of the things that you do is you break the line uh, in front of businesses that, uh, in the spirit of the program, uh, should have advantages. Um, and I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm concerned about that. Uh, and and I think there's a, maybe a misconception about opportunities out there. I will use another example of an individual or company, a uh, concrete contractor who uh, had, has probably 15, 20 years experience. Uh, he's a, a person of color, yet uh, he, he was pursuing, he and his wife are pursuing a certification as a woman-owned business. And I asked him, what kind of experience does his wife have in con concrete construction? And he said, absolutely none. So my question to him was, why would you seek a woman-owned certification, a woman-owned business certification, rather than a certification as a minority business? 
uh, it, those are just some of the concerns that I have and perhaps some of the misconceptions that may be out there by individuals who seek these opportunities. And I would like to think that uh, in whatever projects that we have, uh, if necessary, that uh, even though women-owned firms are le legally, legitimately certified as women-owned companies, but are well-established businesses that, that acquired these certifications simply to take these advantages, that they be identified as such. Now, that's a concern of mine. So those are, those are my comments. Thank you, Marlon. And I'm sure Carol will pull that information together per your request. Do we have any questions for Ian, Carol, or Kellen by the board? Um, <clears throat> Tim, this is Glenn Farner. I have a couple of questions. Come on. Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, Carol, I guess, I guess uh, since you gave a report on the contractors, uh, this would be a question uh, for you, and that is, um, in that report of the contractors, does that include just the contractors that have been directly awarded, um, and um, does it also include the subcontractors? These are, this represent the contractors and subcontractors. Okay. Does it include independent contractors? When you say independent, you mean non-certified contractors? Non-licensed contractors? No, no, no. Yes. Are you are you referring when you say independent contractors? Uh, I'm saying if there is anyone on the project that is being issued that is either being paid as a contract or a uh, subcontractor or as a 1099, they would be acting as a contractor, correct? They wouldn't be an employee. They've either got to be an employee or a contractor. That's correct. Right. right. So, so this would be the individuals that are being listed. I, 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 what I'm saying is, is all the contractors, they've either got to be employees or contractors. And what I'm asking is, is the numbers that you're given on the contractors, do they include all non-employee contracts? These are non-employee, these are uh, all contractors, and these contractors also have employees working for them, but we are only reporting uh, the subcontractors, the owners of these companies, not their employees. The employees are being uh, referenced through the workforce hours work right I, I get that i guess I, I know it wouldn't include employees but what i'm asking is would include sometimes contractors hire 1099 employed as employees rather than as subcontractors and i'm just asking can we if we're not already can we include those numbers in this If they are 1099 uh, independent contractors working working as subcontractors with some of our first tier prime contractors, is that what you're asking? Well, okay. Let me let me let me say it this way. So, if the prime contractor hires a subcontractor, and that subcontract, let's say it's a concrete contractor. And that contractor hires three different subcontractors, one for placement, one for the steel, and one for the finishing, okay? Yes. The contractor, so presumably it would include the, the business of the uh, prime contractor, the business of the subcontractor, and I don't know, once we get down to second or third tier, sometimes the contractors hire 1099 as independent contractors. So they hire them as individuals, as contractors. And I'm just saying, so they're either employees or they're contractors, whether or not they're licensed, can we include those in the numbers? Are they, I presume they're not based on the numbers. And if not, can we get them included in the numbers? 
and then separate it out like you do women, business enterprise, and then uh, 1099 or independent contractors? Yes, we can. Okay, great. And one other question, gentleman talked about, he mentioned 250 craft personnel. Yes. On that, uh, I, I get, um, uh, presumably those are working for all of the different companies. Do we know what kind of impact that would have, um, say, uh, locally? So, uh, so basically we report women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, small businesses. But once they hire the 250 craft personnel, we don't know what part of those are women, what part of those are minorities, uh, what part of those are even, say, Davidson County residents. Um, and what would be great is if we had that, we would know what the uh, ultimate, not just the awarded value, but the actual jobs uh, impact is uh, locally. Okay. So you're asking, can we break out the actual workers based on um, whether they are minority women? Correct. Or, or and and residents in Davidson County, just like we breaking out the businesses. Yes, that's, okay. that's what I'm asking. It's just give us more detail on the actual craft personnel because you know that way we we know kind of what what the impact is having locally. Okay. That's all. Okay. That'd we be great. That. Thank you, Carol. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions for Carol? Ian or Kellen at this time by the board. Thank you for that presentation. Um, it's tremendous progress and, and we appreciate the uh, detailed update. Moving on, this brings us to, <clears throat> uh, yes. Hand it off to Ron. Yes. Uh, thank you, I'm I'm so you Ron. That's okay. I've I, uh, we're still in the organizational phase on the infrastructural project. Uh, just want to, Bell, Bell and Associates is the construction managers, if you recall. They have, uh, they're in the permitting phase. They're in the process of coordinating with the contractors for the stadium uh, so that we can make sure that essential utilities reach them and in conjunction with air construction. Um, we also have another fairgrounds project going on. As you recall, the primarily this contract is for the extension of Wedgwood all the way to Craighead, which includes a bridge. It also an extension of Benton Avenue, which curves down by the speedway and hits at that point. Uh, so we're permitting, they're, they're getting their job trailer set up. Um, and we're trying to coordinate with both the stadium and the and the design team. So that's that's an overview, and hopefully we'll have well we have we'll we'll have more future meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Are there any questions for Ron Gobble? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Melvin Gill. Ron, what is the what is the uh, time frame for uh, the permitting process? Uh, longer than we'd like. Um, it's complicated because we have a bridge involved as well as the others, but we're hoping to have all the permits in place by mid-March. Thank that, you. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. yes, thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Okay, next up we have our AFC South champions. The Tennessee Titans and Nissan Stadium will give their update. I believe Burke will start this off. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and, and before I start, um, on behalf of the Titans, I'd like to congratulate Nashville SC on a, an unbelievable uh, and truly unique uh, expansion season. Uh, Ian wondered out loud whether it was the most challenging expansion season, and I, gosh, I, I don't know who would uh, be the challenger 
uh, considering the tornado and the, and the pandemic and, and with their success on the field and in the community. Um, we're, we're very proud to um, be partnering with them here at, at the stadium um, as their stadium is under construction and uh, just a, a hearty congratulations on behalf of the Titans. Um, so uh, I, I want to hit on a couple things. One, a, a brief overview of uh, a look back of, for 2020 for our organization and then also a look ahead uh, for uh, to, to cover with the Sports Authority some recent announcements that were made about the, the future of Nissan Stadium. Um, I, I thought I, I might structure the look back uh, around our mission as an organization. Uh, we have three primary uh, purposes for existing. Uh, it's to win, to serve, and to entertain. And, and I think in all three areas, uh, looking back on 2020, despite the challenges, uh, we're, we're very proud of the, the growth and progress we've made on, on all three fronts. Um, first of all, to, from a winning perspective, you know, any, any season that ends without a Super Bowl trophy is, is something of a disappointment. But uh, looking back on this season, especially the challenges our, our football staff and players had to confront just to get to the field, um, we're, we're very proud. And, and I think uh, it's, it's especially interesting looking back at a season like this one and, and really remembering where we were six years ago, uh, which was by definition the worst team in the National Football League. Uh, as, as Amy Adams Strunk stepped into her role as controlling owner. Uh, and, and here we are now, uh, one of three teams in the NFL to have a, a winning record for five consecutive seasons. So um, uh, speaking of, of women owned businesses, Amy uh, has, has put her stamp on this organization in a, in a really special way. And, uh, and, and we're, we're starting to see a ton of success on the field because of, of the decisions she's made and the, the influence she's had. I, I'm, I'm still uh, one slide up, if you don't mind, uh, going back. Uh, but yes, looking back on this specific season, uh, it was our first division championship since 2008 uh, and also the first home playoff game in 12 years. Um, in some ways, it's a shame that, that 69,000 Nashvillians uh, weren't there to see it, but um, we're, we're grateful that that 13 or 14,000 or so uh, were able to get into the building and, and cheer on the team. And again, it wasn't the result that we hoped for, but it's a real watermark for us to solidify uh, this this culture of success that, uh, that has been reestablished within the Titans uh, and, and a, a special note to uh, America's favorite uh, wrecking ball of a running back, Derrick Henry, uh, who is the eighth running back in NFL history with 2,000 rushing yards. Um, the NFL has been along, around for a long time, and uh, to be only the, the eighth player to achieve 2,000 rushing yards is a real achievement. And by the way, um, uh, the Titans have 25% of those rushers because uh, Chris Johnson is, is in one of the other 2,000-yard rushers. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, I, I think, you know, having seen uh, Nashville SC's slides on, on these points, and, and I'm sure that, that the Predators and the Sounds, um, you know, would also be able to present very similar slides. Uh, I think this is the, uh, this is, this is, this is the power of sports. This, this was a, an impossible year for Nashville and, and Tennessee. And um, uh, we were grateful to be able to use our, our platforms, our leverage, our resources to, to, to help. And, and to, to move the needle uh, in, in ways that, uh, that we felt like were a, a real uh, effective impact on the community. And it started with tornado relief. Um, you know, as we were driving into to our offices that day, we've got an office over in Metro Center, and then the, the stadium, of course, is, is on uh, the east side of the river. And so our employees were driving through East Nashville and, and driving, driving through North Nashville uh, on the way in. And just to see the devastation was breathtaking. And, uh, put in a call to Amy to ask about making a contribution to, you know, kind of seed and maybe inspire others in the community to, to give back to the recovery effort. And uh, I, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars would be a generous contribution. And and she wanted to to give a one million dollar contribution. So um, just very proud of of her generosity and and uh, our ability to to make that contribution. And within a few days. Um, also, rather than just kind of a ceremonial uh, lending of a hand to, to, to our neighbors, um, we, we pulled up buses and our, our staff, our coaches, our players uh, got on buses with chainsaws that they brought from home and, and other tools and, and, and went and got out into the neighborhoods and were helping clear out refrigerators and, and, and move logs to the, um, you know, off of properties onto the road to, for, for cleanup. 
actually probably pretty handy to have offensive linemen to, to move some of those those things that, that other people uh, weren't able to move. Um, but we're very proud to, um, to to be able to help there. In terms of COVID response, I, I think like everyone, we're, it's it's hard to pinpoint exactly what you can do, but we've, we've tried to do everything that we can. Uh, it started with amplifying the, the government's messages about uh, safety and mask wearing and social distancing and washing hands. Uh, Coach Rabel attended a, a press conference with Mayor Cooper to help reemphasize those messages. We, we used our production team to get messages out about, about safe living in a COVID environment. Um, we also did what we could to support the frontline heroes. Uh, partnered with St. Thomas Health uh, it, for, for one spell actually helped to secure hotel rooms and, and food for frontline workers who weren't able to go home to be with their families because of their exposure uh, to, to the COVID virus during their work day. Um, we also used the stadium facility itself for a PPE drive very early in the pandemic. And, and even today, it's, it's serving as a, as a location for, uh, for COVID testing. Um, and then we've done some creative things too, modifying our youth sports programs, helping uh, coaches that in the spring weren't able to, to do uh, you know, what they would typically be doing in person by rolling out uh, online coaching certification, uh, online programs that, that would uh, help support our youth initiatives uh, in a COVID environment. Um, with the unfortunate Christmas explosion, uh, we, we tried to do what we could there. We, we have made some contributions. Our players have, have really been inspired and, and have, have made uh, quite a bit of contributions uh, to, to the relief efforts. Um, but we were very proud of our six, 615 strong, uh, I'll call it a campaign. Uh, we, we added stickers uh, with 615 and the six highlighted for the six heroes who cleared out Second Street that morning. Um, and, and wore a helmet decal. So uh, 40 million viewers over the course of the games that, that uh, we wore those decals uh, got a glimpse of that. The TV broadcast covered it and, and they got you know, national uh, recognition for their heroism. And then, and then those six first responders also served as our 12th Titan. Uh, I will tell you personally, uh, it was one of the reasons I was most excited to have gotten a home playoff game was the idea that these, these heroes really deserved a proper standing ovation. And, uh, in a COVID environment, that, that wasn't something that was available to them. And so our home playoff game served as an opportunity for thousands of people in Nashville to, to stand and, and cheer and give them the recognition that they deserve. Um, finally, uh, we, we've continued to emphasize social justice as, as one of our core mission. Uh, we've had a We Stand For campaign for, for quite a while that uh, um, allows our players and coaches and staff members to, to amplify causes that are important to them. This year, uh, especially after the George, George Floyd murder, we, uh, we put on online resources under the We Stand For banner that uh, are focused on supporting Black-owned businesses, uh, putting out literature uh, about raw topics around racism uh, to, to educate, and uh, we're proud of, of, of what we were able to accomplish there. We also started a Real Conversations with a Titan program where our players uh, over Zoom calls were able to connect with students and, and, and tell about their journey and, and their, their encounters with racism and, and social injustice. Uh, and then finally, uh, perhaps appropriately, the day after inauguration, uh, we, we really went all in with I Am A Voter uh, to, to get our staff, our players, and the community registered to vote in the, the 2020 election. Uh, next slide. And, and so again, as, a, as, as, as an organization that feels like it's important to, to focus on entertaining. Um, this was an interesting year to try to do that because it, at first there, we weren't able to do a host CMA Fest. We weren't able to host concerts and things that we would typically do during the off season. So we invested in, in staff to deliver quality digital entertainment and the storytelling has been spectacular. I know better than to try to show videos over WebEx or Zoom. Uh, that, that doesn't usually work out very well. But if I could show you some of the videos that we've we've put out, it really has gone to a different level. I don't think there's a, an organization in the National Football League that's delivering better high quality storytelling content uh, that ties the Titans to the community. I think it's inspiring content and and we were very proud to, to be putting that out there, uh, especially for our fans who couldn't come to games. Uh, and then of course, you know, it's, it's one little bullet here, but uh, we were able to host uh, eight to 12,000 fans for eight Titans games this year and, and, and several uh, Nashville SC games as well. 
Um, that was a Herculean effort across our organization. Uh, Nashville SC had resources applied. There were, there were third party organizations, the city was involved. And um, looking back, the Titans hosted, I believe it's the sixth most fans in all of the National Football League. And most importantly, it was done well. And we, we have, uh, the NFL does research and there's not a single COVID case that is tied to uh, any any events at Nissan Stadium. So very proud of that and felt like that that offered a, a sense of community and, and, and relief in some ways um, in, in what is a challenging year. Uh, next slide. And actually you can just go up too. So I'm gonna transition into uh, a, a, an update about the future of Nissan Stadium. Uh, as, as some of you I'm sure have seen, uh, we made an announcement with Mayor Cooper in December uh, around the future of Nissan Stadium. And to be very, very clear, uh, the announcement was about the fact that formal discussions are happening. There is no plan, there's no agreement, uh, but we just felt like it was important in the spirit of transparency, uh, in the interest of getting feedback from the community and civic leaders that we very early on uh, let the public know that we're having these conversations uh, so that that uh, they can participate. Uh, but those, those conversations are built around really three major tenants. Uh, one is keeping the Titans in Nashville forever. Uh, we love it here. We feel like we're, we're a part of the fabric here. Uh, and and uh, with 10 years left on our lease and what I know the sports authority all, all too well understands is a challenging uh, lease and, and, and uh, facility situation. Um, we we wanna take, take the time now to, to lock in on, on Nashville and Tennessee as our home uh, forever. Um, second piece is, it is probably time to talk about modernizing Nissan Stadium uh, by NFL standards, by entertainment and, and sports venue standards, uh, the stadium has fallen behind. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done that the public will never see from an infrastructure standpoint. Uh, I, most of you know the Sports Authority's own study showed that there's $300 million worth of renovations that will be required over the next short term. And, and so it's time to start talking about, uh, you know, what sort of renovations are necessary. Um, and then the third piece, which is, which is very exciting to us, is, is really more Nashville-centric, which is this idea that, that we're sitting on about 100 acres. And uh, it's a little bit less than that is the sports authority land, but, but there's neighboring uh, parcels that, that are also, you know, related, for example, the Juvenile Justice Center. And, and the city is interested in developing the East Bank in, in a way that creates a community asset, something of a crown jewel uh, that, that connects downtown to surrounding neighborhoods, uh, you know, asking this question, what would you do if you had a blank slate of real estate in the middle of one of the most vibrant cities in, in the country that, uh, you know, how would you use that? And, and we've uh, volunteered to Mayor Cooper that we are very happy to, to be a catalyst in that process. Um, next slide. So in terms of what creating a new East Bank neighborhood would look like, again, our campus, uh, the Sports Authority property is not a full 100 acres, but it's close and, and there, are, there are neighboring properties that would also participate in, in the development. Um, the, the activity from the neighborhood, we've, we've had some studies done and, and it, would, it would generate tens of millions of dollars of, of new tax increment that doesn't exist today um, to, to help, uh, one, help keep the stadium updated. Uh, but more importantly, have plenty of overflow to, to, to pay teachers and police officers and, and other city needs. Um, in terms of what uh, concepts are under consideration, I, I think pretty clearly it would be some sort of mixed use development. So uh, residential, office, retail, but something that would be a real asset to, to the city in terms of the type of local businesses, uh, the, the different diverse types of housing that, that, that would be here. Um, one very important piece to, to the city is that we would take advantage of the riverfront. You know, there's a path that goes through here now, there's a few parks that get used sometimes, but the idea of looking at the entire East Bank as something of a, an opportunity to really provide a, a, an asset to the city that, that's not being fully realized yet and, uh, to activate this, this beautiful riverfront with the beautiful downtown views um, and, and create, create a sense of place. Uh, on the East Bank for, for Nashvillians, less for tourists, uh, more for people who live in East Nashville 
and the Casey neighborhood and, and Edgefield and, and surrounding neighborhoods or people from around Nashville who, who want to have a kind of different downtown experience than, than uh, on the, the west side of the, the river. Um, and importantly, uh, our, neighbor, our, our campus would be used very deliberately to make connections between East Nashville and Casey and Edgefield and these surrounding neighborhoods and downtown. Uh, right now, our campus serves as something of, a, of an island. And uh, so we want to, from bike paths and walking paths and roads, make sure that the connections are easier uh, on the other side of any sort of development. Uh, next slide. So uh, also need to be very clear, the slides you're about to see now, we describe as concept art. Uh, one of the early things that we did uh, was to try to determine, do the bones of this stadium, which, which we love, do they support a, a modernized approach to uh, sports and entertainment venues that are uh, representative of Nashville? That are that are uh, that, that is there a concept out there that that Nashville will be proud of? And uh, the goal of that we, we we hired some architects to do some work, and the goal was to create diversified experiences within the stadium. And we're very pleased they came back with some ideas that show that. Certainly, there, there, there is a, a means to an end to, to create that experience that we're, we're hoping uh, Nashville or uh, Nissan Stadium will become uh, in the coming years. The, the first slide that you see here is, is a concept that would be open to the masses. Everyone who comes to any events at the stadium, uh, we have this envisioned for the south end zone area, a concept like this, which could have a concert stage and, and places to have interesting dining experiences when, when they come to a game. Uh, or, or a concert. And uh, if you've been to any of our events recently, there's very often some, some pop-up sorts of uh, activities in that south end zone. And this would be giving them a sense of permanence and, and likely something that if you could figure out a way to remove the gates would actually create something of a plaza that, that people who may be living in the neighborhood on the East Bank could use um, uh, 365 days a year. Uh, next slide. So on the other end of the spectrum, one, one theme at, at lots of stadiums uh, or around the country, the more modern stadiums, uh, they, they try to also offer some high-end experiences. Uh, and and this, this concept that the architects found is an idea of building into uh, a, a, an area in our service level that would, would deliver just that, something that is a more exclusive, uh, higher end experience, but uh, is something that uh, seems that the market wants and, and we would be able to provide in, in a renovation. Uh, next slide. Also looking to maybe build up into air. If you, if you look at most stadiums, they're a full wrap. And as part of the value engineering at, uh, at the stadium, uh, when it was initially constructed, uh, our, our stadium ends at the end zones uh, in terms of a second and third level. And, and so there's a there's a concept that's that they're being they're exploring of just kind of building onto uh, the outside of some of those areas and some interesting diverse concepts uh, that that could be explored there. Uh, next slide. This is just an interior view of of one of those uh, corner clubs. So you can move on to the next slide. So another another concept that being explored, I will unapologetically uh, give credit to the sounds and uh, their bandbox concept. Uh, every time I've gone to a sounds game, you just see the millennials crowding there. Frankly, probably not paying as much attention to the game as much as the social experience that being at the game and in that bandbox area provides. So we're interested in finding similar sorts of opportunities within the stadium, understanding that that consumer. Uh, behavior is changing, especially with the younger generation. And so the idea here would be to repurpose some of the 300 level, which frankly can be hard to sell, uh, into, into a more millennial focus, perhaps even standing room only uh, experience. Uh, next slide. So where are we and, and what's next? Uh, we're digging into a couple of things now, uh, you know, first quarter of 2020, 2021, I guess. Uh, one, we're doing campus and facility studies, uh, both continuing to look at our campus and, and or sorry, our facility and, and understanding what can be done here, what the market wants, what our fans want, what, what Nashville wants for, uh, you know, non-Titans events in terms of uh, any sort of renovation to our stadium. But also, probably more importantly, and, and a lot more work, is looking at the campus. 
and understanding flood plans and, and traffic patterns and the things that would be required to actually activate this dream of, of converting our campus into uh, a neighborhood that's, that's an asset to Nashville. Uh, and those studies are, are well underway. Uh, the second is community and family outreach. We're, we're pretty deep into that, uh, but at the same time, probably just getting started, I would say. Uh, asking our fans questions and, and actively trying to find the right neighborhood groups, civic leaders, others to, to be soliciting feedback uh, on not just the stadium work itself, but really more importantly, again, with this blank, ca blank canvas on the East Bank, you know, what, what are, the, what are the, the types of amenities, businesses, uh, you know, public space that, that the community would want to see here. And we're partnering with the city on, on those types of conversations. And then lastly, you know, to be perfectly candid, there's still a lot of work to be done with the city and the state in terms of uh, making, making everything work from an agreement perspective and, and legislative perspective. So those conversations are ongoing. So the last slide that I, I will leave you with before responding to any questions is just a, a, a picture of the mural that we have on uh, Korean Veterans Boulevard. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been very well received, uh, hopefully uh, has, has been somewhat inspiring to, to people in Nashville and Tennessee to continue to live Tennessee tough uh, throughout these challenging times. Thank you, Bert, for that presentation. I'm sure we do have questions. Um, are there any questions by the board? In the meantime, can you hear the construction noise? I'm actually working from the stadium today, uh, and there are crews out here working on the leaks uh, that have uh, infiltrated the building over the last couple of years. So my apologies if you hear construction noise in the background. That's okay. We understand it's progress. Kim, it's Margaret. Um, I, really, I want to compliment Nashville SC and Ian, his team, and also Bert and the Titans for these presentations. They have been excellent. Um, just so many good things about it. Uh, Bert, I really like this to win, to serve, to entertain. That's a great mission statement, and I think you're presentation really carried out that mission. Um, just want to say that um, uh, these plans look, I you know everything is just initial plans, but the East Bank space, uh, the connections that you talked about with East Nashville, the bypass the roads, you mentioned Casey Holmes a couple of times. I know there's a lot to work out, maybe some state legislation, but, but that it seems like such a good path forward to uh, deal with some of the infrastructure issues that we have and the cost and uh, just very creative. And I want to congratulate you and your team uh, for that. And also, I really like the South End Zone design you showed us and the third, <laughs> the upper deck, at the third level and some of the ideas. Uh, and the success of the sounds and, and incorporating that into your remarks. So just uh, mostly congratulations to you and to Amy Adams Strunk for what you're doing at this point. Just very impressed. Thank you, Margaret. And we will uh, we will add your comments on the, uh, the stadium opportunities to our, our list of fan feedback. Speaking of that, Burke, I uh, completed my survey yesterday as a, a Titans season ticket holder. Uh, feedback. Um, it's good to see you guys are proactively reaching out and engaging in these conversations. Are there other comments, questions by the board? Hearing none at this point, thank you again for that excellent presentation. And we know we will continue this theme of excellent presenters. As a next step, we will hear from the Nashville Predators and Bridgestone Arena for their update. All right, good morning. This is uh, Kyle Clayton, the Vice President of Operations for the Nashville Predators, Bridgestone Arena, and Ford Ice Centers. Uh, first, I want to again congratulate Nashville SC and the Titans on their great seasons. Um, as we're about to kick ours off, hopefully we can uh, continue that success 
in our city. Uh, when we look back at 2020, I mean, obviously the constant theme of, for the whole year has been challenges, right? You know, pandemics, civil unrest, tornadoes, uh, the explosion. Again, it's just so many hardships for our uh, our friends and our neighbors. You know, right now we're all wearing masks, we're on Zoom calls, again, there's just a the norm that we're all trying to get used to. Uh, but as we look back, we really wanted to uh, find some things to celebrate. And again, our organization just goes above and beyond, and we're really excited about a lot of things that we were able to accomplish this year. Uh, early in the pandemic, we, uh, we came out with a goal, right? And our goal was to come out of this stronger uh, than we went into it. And so with that goal, we, we focused on two primary areas. Uh, one of those was to keep our fans safe, whether that was you know, promoting uh, mask initiatives, uh, partnering with the city and the state on different initiatives to uh, keep everybody safe, but then also just planning for a return to Bridgestone Arena. We didn't know when that was going to be, but uh, just putting those plans in place and, and obviously changing those every day up until the time we actually allow fans back in. And the second goal or second area of focus was to give back to the community. Our foundation and our organization does such a great job of just entrenching our, our brand within the community. So I really wanted to take a, a primary focus on that as well. Um, I've got a great uh, roster of folks today from organization to uh, tell you a lot about those things and then also talk about the, uh, the season that we just started. So I'll go ahead and introduce everybody and then we'll just kind of roll through it. Again, feel free to stop and ask any questions as we go. But uh, to start us off, we're going to have Rebecca King, our Vice President of Community Relations. Uh, we're going to have Chris Mason, our TV broadcaster, color analyst, also a former player. And we're going to have David Kells, our Senior Vice President of Marketing and Entertainment. Um, again, if you have any questions, please stop us. And uh, thanks so much for your support. And I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you, Kyle. Um, as you mentioned, there is so much to celebrate in 2020. And just want to do a high level um, conversation about some of those things that we are extremely proud of. Um, January 2020, we did launch a long term partnership with TSU. Uh, the campaign was called One Million in One Month Campaign. Uh, to help TSU students who need the small boost to continue the path to becoming our next leaders. Um, to date, this has raised over $1.8 million. So it has been a successful campaign in partnership with them. February led into our Hockey is for Everyone month. Uh, we had Hockey Has Heart, uh, which is a recognizing congenital heart defects. And we had a special guest appearance with Luke Bryan, who performed the anthem as he has strong ties to congenital heart defects. We held a Pride Night and also Hockey Fights Cancer Night. So it was a very busy month highlighting a lot of our initiatives. We also continued our groundbreaking partnership with the Smile Direct Club. Um, we gave out super grants to Shower Up, My Friend's House, Thistle Farms, Operation Stand Down, and Friend's Life. These grants ra uh, ranged from $25,000 to $100,000 and totaled over $250,000 last year. Uh, this is a partnership that's going to continue for the next five years, um, and these large grants are really dramatically impacting these organizations, and we are in the current process of awarding our super grants for 2021. March is our Ford Military Salute Week, and a highlight of that partnership is with uh, MTSU and the Charlie and Hazel Daniels Veterans and Family Center. Um, we helped establish the fund to support local population of military connected to students who struggle financially. So we are proud to partner with them on that initiative. March kicked off with the tornadoes and the pandemics, uh, which necessitated the cancellation of the SEC tournament and then also Bridgestone Arena events and the pause of the Pred season. Uh, in approximately seven weeks, we raised more than $2.7 million to help address tornado relief efforts and those impacted by COVID. Um, some of these were created by um, our ownership, our players, and then we also had several NHL teams jump on board and make contributions to the fund. Um, we raised $250,000 for the Community Fund of Middle Tennessee. Bridgestone Arena and Fort Ice Centers in both Antioch and Bellevue turned into collection sites for tornado relief surprise. And we also created Nashville Strong merchandise and um, t-shirts and sweatshirts to raise money for the fund. Our fashion show, which is a big fundraiser for the foundation, was canceled, but we continued to host the auction and all of the money raised from that went to Tornado Relief. Uh, for the COVID relief and response, following SEC tournament cancellation, 
Um, we came together and raised a million dollars to fund uh, to ensure Bridgestone Arena event night staff would be can paid for canceled events in postponed Preds games. Uh, the Preds Foundation donated $100,000 to the Mayor Relief Fund, and we launched a program called Feeding the Front Lines, where we engage with our corporate partners to deliver meals to police, fire, um, and local hospitals. Um, this initiative was supported by our, our hockey ops, our ownership, and several of our players as well. Um, we also earmarked $200,000 for tornado relief efforts um, to be split between the different areas impacted. Uh, from the very start of the pandemic, um, the Preds vowed to continue caring for every season ticket citizen, and all payment requests were suspended, and all renewals and playoff deadlines. Um, our fan base has been very appreciative of the communication we have had and our partnership um, during this very uncertain time. For the first time ever, we did host a virtual fan appreciation night to honor and thank our fans. Uh, some of our players jumped in um, at, at amazing levels. Captain Roman Yossi and his wife donated $60,000. $20,000 went to Second Harvest, $20,000 went to Home Street Home, and then $20,000 went to Best Buddies. Uh, the Preds Foundation also had their annual grant distribution totaling $700,000. Organizations applied in January. What their needs ended up being in April was probably very different. So we allowed all these organizations, which there are 168 in total, to reallocate the funding towards operational expenses and salaries, which is not something we typically fund. Um, and the organizations were hugely appreciative in this pandemic. And then we also received an award from the FBI Memphis office uh, the 2019 Directors Community Leadership Award, and we've had a great partnership with the FBI and their community outreach. Mike Fisher made an $80,000 donation to our community, with $20,000 going to Nashville Inner City Ministry, Rocket Town, Rim in the Inn, and Cottage Cove. Um, we also hosted a check presentation in Cookville um, with the two mayors there and, and put the money towards tornado relief efforts. Uh, this fall, we had the fortune of hosting three events that take place outdoors, which allowed us to um, continue with those efforts. We had our, held our golf tournament, which raised $100,000 for the Preds Foundation and also Peterson Foundation for Parkinson's. Um, we have a fishing tournament, which takes place on Old Hickory Lake, and we were able to raise significant dollars for the 365 Pediatric Cancer Fund presented by Twice Daily. And then Mike Fisher continued his clay shoot. Um, and we raised eighty thousand dollars through that. So um, we are thankful to have outdoor events that we can still host and continue to raise money. November is Hockey Fights Cancer Month, and we were able to raise over a hundred thousand dollars throughout the month. Um, each day, we highlighted children that had received uh, treatment at Children's Hospital, and some of the kids are still in treatment, and some of the kids are ten years in remission graduated from college and now in PA school um, and their desire to give back to the medical community thanks to Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital. Um, for the second consecutive year, the Preds were named one of the best employers in sports by Front Office Sports. We were just one of three professional sports teams to earn this honor in both years um, of the award's existence. Nashville is the only NHL franchise on the list in 2020. So we're very proud of our work and being a part of that um, group. Christmas morning, of course, brought uh, another tragedy to our town. Uh, the Preds organization and Bridgestone Arena sprang into action. Um, our arena became a command center for the Metro National Police, FBI, TBI, ATF, DOJ, and many others. Um, they were able to use our atrium, our meeting rooms, the Patron Club, the garage, um, and we, we didn't say no to their requests. We opened our doors, um, and, and they were grateful, and we were appreciative to have that partnership and the fact that they know they can call us, and we will do what we can to help in these efforts. Uh, we did a Smashville Strong auction. Uh, we auctioned off 15-minute Zoom call, calls with each of our players. Um, and through our auction and our merchandise, we raised $30,000 to be split between the Nashville Neighbors Fund and the Community Resource Center. Another great thing um, that we have been working on this year are our blood drives. 
We used to host just two a year and it would help a few hundred people. Well, we have the capabilities of doing a lot more. And so this year we hosted a drive every 60 days. Uh, we collected over 3,400 pints of blood, which helps the lives of over 10,000 people. The drives take place from Memphis to Knoxville, Huntsville to Bowling Green, and dozens of cities in between. And our impact has dramatically increased. And just for a point of reference, in 2017, we collected 117 units of blood. In 2020, again, we collected 3,400 units of blood. Um, this year, 2021, our goal is to collect 6,000 pints and again, uh, dramatically increase our impact. We did hear from American Red Cross yesterday that because of the work of the community and our drives that we held in December was the first time that they didn't have to go on a national desperate need list to get blood shipped to them. So um, through these drives, they were able to sustain through the start of the new year. Um, our sincere hope through the efforts described here is that we're able to positively impact the lives in our community um, as 2021 season continues, we have no intention of letting up um, and we'll work with to help heal Nashville um, over everything that happened over the past 12 months. So thank you for listening to our past year and um, look forward to seeing what we're able to do in 2021. And next up, I'm going to pass it off to Chris Mason for his update. Thank you, Rebecca. I know um, Chris is still on mute. Um, there, there we go. I, right. I figured it out. Excellent. Good old technology. Thanks, <laughs> Rebecca. Thank you, guys. Uh, tricky big congrats. It, it really is. Uh, it really is. Uh, big congrats to uh, Tennessee Titans and uh, Nashville SC on, on just remarkable seasons. It was, uh, it was awesome following along. I'll get into the hockey stuff. Uh, 2020 um, started off with, uh, with a first for the Nashville Predators. Uh, they traveled to Dallas to face the Dallas Stars in the Bridgestone NHL Winter Classic. I actually got to be in attendance as a fan. Um, that day was just an incredible event. And the best part about that was that I was joined by 25,000, over 25,000 Preds fans that made the trip uh, to Dallas at Cotton Bowl. And that was a really, really special uh, event, one that uh, we'll all never forget, uh, especially seeing all that gold in the stands drowning out the, the green, the awful green. So that was really cool. Um, uh, we had a coaching change shortly after that. John Hines was named the third, only the third head coach in franchise history. Um, so it was really cool to get uh, a fresh voice coming in. I think the team was a little stagnant there and they needed a change. And uh, he's been a really great addition. Um, I'll talk more about the team this year, but he's really instilled a lot of uh, great values into the team, kind of going back to the olden days, uh, the predator way, if you will, um, the hardworking, gritty, uh, just never, never relent type of attack and type of a team that you can be proud of every time they step on the ice. And, and so far, they've really, they've really uh, got on board with that, with that philosophy. And uh, kind of a, a few days later, his first win was overshadowed by our very own legend, Pekka Rene. Our goaltender scored his first goal, becoming just the seventh goalie in NHL history to shoot the puck in the net. Um, and between him and Juice, I got credit for a goal way back in the day. I didn't touch it. I was just the last player to touch it. So, again, Pekka knocks me. Between him and Juice, they've knocked me so far down the list, I don't even think my name is, is on any of those. But it was, uh, it was an incredible moment, and we got to cover that one in the broadcast. And man, it was Willie Donick and I were just jumping. Uh, we got just, just nuts on that one. So that was really cool um, to see that. Uh, Roman Yossi uh, represented the Preds at the 2020 NHL All-Star Weekend along with four of our young hockey players from the Ford Ice Center. So obviously Roman Yossi, our captain, one of the best ambassadors of our team, the Nashville Predators, Bridgestone Arena, and our city, Nashville. That was really cool to see him there, well-deserved. Um, after that, uh, we got the season interrupted just when John Hines was taking over and uh, getting his team on track. They're playing some great hockey. We had the shutdown, but they came back um, for the, the return to play and they came up with uh, a mantra. You know, I felt uh, that they felt with everything that the city um, has gone through that they wanted to really embody that and embrace that. And it was uh, for Smashville. And the players really got on board with that. And obviously, um, the Nashville Predators since day one in 1998 have really uh, developed an amazing 
relationship with this city, its fans, and it just went all in, and it just continues to grow, um, you know, as, as we go along here. So that was really cool to see. Um, Predators fell a little bit short in the in the qualifier. Uh, tough, tough situation, but uh, one really cool thing that came out of that was in conjunction with their opponent, the Arizona Coyotes, they executed an expansive blood drive in multiple states uh, and collected 100 of items uh, for local animal shelters. I thought that was really cool. Blood drives are one of the, you know, the biggest challenges, I think, during the pandemic because, um, you know, everybody was at home and, you know, people still need to, uh, need to get blood transfusions and i think it was really awesome how they were able to do that safely and and effectively um and more on the captain roman yossi he won the norris trophy which is awarded to the best all-around defenseman uh in the regular season he had uh, a season for the books um and one of the cool things is we're able to celebrate with with roman socially distance uh the national predators did an amazing job uh they hosted a little event at bridgestone and it was really cool um, Roman got to Zoom all his family, his friends, even Roger Federer was on there for a little bit. And, uh, you know, a bunch of our loyal employees showed up and Roman was really touched by that. People coming down there to, to recognize him. And it was really cool to see uh, to see that and, and how, you know, elated Roman was that he got the support from, from his team. Um, moving on here. Um, uh, like, I'll I just give to it. to block them off because... I would like to be evolving to that, um, but they just don't. Hey, Chris, there you yeah. go. We had some interference, continue on. Okay, I thought I was getting cut off there, sorry. No, 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 okay. we're here, we're okay. here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and another big event was, obviously everything's done over the Zooms and virtually, uh, they held uh, a draft at Bridgestone Arena. We had some fans in attendance uh, in the Lexus Lounge, everything's socially distanced, of course, and it was really cool. We got a, a really high-end draft pick, 11th overall. It's been a while since the Predators have uh, stockpiled some good quality picks, and this is the lowest one in a long time. We got a, uh, a really elite prospect uh, goaltender in uh, Yaroslav uh, Askarov, a Russian kid um, who's going to be a superstar in this league. So that's a big moment. You always got to keep building for the future. Um, so as of now, we're set in goal, but a few years down the road, uh, look to see him. Uh, in the Preds net. Um, and again, we had uh, a lot of our season ticket citizens in attendance for that to be able to enjoy that. Um, and then in the final month, the Preds are given a reason to look forward to 2020. The NHL and NHLP announced, uh, NHLPA announced the return to game. The Preds are already three games in. They're two and one. And all the things I said about John Hines uh, have really taken uh, effect. They, they are working their butts off on the ice. Uh, it's a team that uh, early in the season, obviously, but you can just tell the the conviction that they're playing with. And, you know, when you hear them all uh, talk about this, a lot of uh, anticipation before the season, you hear the catchphrases, we need to get grittier, we need to work harder and all these types of things. Um, it's easy to say that everybody, every team, I think in every sport will say that at the beginning of the season. But once, you know, the puck drops in hockey and, and you see the product on the ice, there, there's no hiding it. That does the talking. And the guys have certainly done that. Um, they had a big uh, a big off season, uh, the biggest turnover uh, in our roster for a lot of years. Um, they brought in six, seven new players. Uh, Luke Cunning was uh, we acquired him in a trade from the Minnesota Wild. Brad Richardson signed. Um, he actually scored the goal to knock the Predators out of the playoffs. He's a really gritty, hardworking veteran, uh, really character type of player. Um, we also added Eric Halla, another hardworking, fast, skilled type of guy that fits that mold of what the team uh, really wants to be. Nick Cousins, um, he's a real agitator. You watch the game out there, and um, you'll notice him on the ice getting underneath the teams of, uh, underneath the other team's skin, and he's just always he's always in there. He's getting noticed, and he's always making an impact really, really well out there for the Preds. So another great addition. Again, some of the characteristics that uh, we're missing a little bit. Uh, from the, the past couple years. Uh, Mark Borbietsky, um, just an unbelievable person, really involved in the community. He's played his entire career in Ottawa, and he signed with the Nashville Predators, really hard work and just quality, blue-collar type of a player, really physical presence uh, on the ice, but also in the community. He makes a huge impact in the community, so uh, we, we definitely welcome uh, him to the, the club. And Matt Benning, good shutdown defenseman uh, to help solidify that third pair. And a uh, really good start to the season. 
really proud of, of this team and, and this organization. And as Rebecca alluded to and Kyle too, it's just uh, just an amazing organization. I'll just add that our Nashville Predators alumni, local alumni here, we held a, an alumni fantasy camp. And uh, through that fantasy camp, we brought in other NHL alumni, hosted it at Fordyce, who did just uh, just an incredible job. And they also did an amazing job coming back getting up and running all the hard work that went into that socially distant so people could uh, you know get back to some sort of normalcy um, they did an amazing job and they hosted our event we we're able to raise eighty five thousand uh, dollars through the Preds Foundation for that to uh, the charity that we support so you know a lot a lot to be thankful for in, in a really tough year and, and just really proud to, uh, to be part of this organization and uh, with that I will hand it off to my main man David Kells. Thank if you. anyone has questions, you, you can fire away. But uh, if not, David, you're up, buddy. David, we look forward to your brief uh, summary of all the great things you guys are doing. Kick, <laughs> kick it off. Thank you for that kickoff, Chris. And uh, thank you, Kim, for the uh, introduction. Um, one of the other major campaigns we had over uh, 2020 was working with Secretary of State Trey Hargett uh, to help register for people to vote, uh, get out the vote, and uh, have the necessary need for poll workers. So we worked with them starting really in December of 19 uh, to get PSAs with our players and uh, messages out throughout all of our channels and um, to have a very, very successful election in the state of Tennessee. And for that, we were awarded the National Association of Secretaries of States Medallion Award. Um, so that was a wonderful recognition of that partnership with them to uh, take part in uh, elections that are always important, and this year obviously had a much, much larger spotlight on it than, than, than in years past. Um, as venue operators, you know, safety is always top of mind for all of us. And this year we had to open a new chapter in that safety book. Um, and it was learning about how to operate a venue during a global pandemic, how to operate back of house uh, measures um, in situations that none of us have ever been a part of. So we were all learning on the fly, but also had wonderful, wonderful support from Hugh Atkins and everybody at Metro Health along the way to get us from you know, where we were in March when we stopped hosting events to where we were last week when we opened up Bridgestone Arena uh, for some home games. So yeah, big thanks to Hugh Atkins and everybody at Metro Health. Thank you to everybody on the Bridgestone Arena return to events team who just dug in to all corners and looked for all different um, avenues of information of how to open safely, how to operate our training camp safely in the summer for a return to play. And then again, uh, what we did this last month to get everybody ready for, for hockey. And then finally, that last little step of it is to get fans into the building. And we're thrilled to announce that this morning, uh, we have put out a channels for season ticket holders to start coming back to the building, starting on the games on the 26th and 27th of next week. So we'll do slow and steady. Um, couple hundred tickets here, a couple hundred tickets there as we grow uh, the capacity to let people in safer and safer over time. Some of the new things uh, around the arena, uh, we have joined the musicians for a smoke-free Nashville. So we are now a completely smoke-free campus um, from the time you step onto the plaza to the time you leave the, the building after the final horn. Uh, there's no smoking on our property. Um, a mask mandate for all uh, guests who come into the building, except when they're actively eating and drinking. So it's, it's literally mask on, pull it down for a second, take a sip of your beverage, put it back on. And uh, that's been great for the compliance of everybody working with us and uh, our security folks and the uh, Metro Board of Health people who are out there every game. Uh, we've gone to a no bag policy. We've implement, we've gone cashless. So everything is either, you know, the touch pads on your phones or, or cards. And we're also bringing in reverse H for people and um, so it's a lot of new things we've been communicating them to our, our season ticket holders and to our fans and so far uh, the small test groups that we've done of, of friends and family have you know have operated within what we need everybody to do to be safe because if we can do these games safe we can invite more fans we can do more games together we invite in more fans and that snowball just keeps going um, because we all know what the environment is like in Bridgestone Arena, when it's filled with 17,000 people, when everybody's cheering and chanting and how much how much that just makes the team better, how much that makes the experience better, and we hope to get there soon. Um, and thankfully, early on, people understand that and that we know that we can all get to there, there together by acting in a safe and responsible manner. And that's my uh, 
update on safety and procedures. Please let me know if you have any questions. And after that, we'll go back to Kyle. Thank you, David. I don't know if um, Al is still with us or not, but uh, we really appreciate the Predators report. Are there any questions for the organization before we move on to our next facility? Well, thank you. We know um, you guys don't let up and you won't let up. And uh, we're all eagerly excited to, to be back in the arena. So um, if there are no questions, then we will move on to the Nashville Sounds First Horizon Park update. Thank you all. Hope to see you soon. All right. Uh, good afternoon now. Uh, my name is Adam Nace, General Manager here with the Nashville Sounds. Also have Doug Scopel, Vice President of Ops, on our call as well. Uh, we have been crossing off our notes and talking points, so we will uh, have a nice short presentation kind of by design, but uh, we will um, kind of first start with, uh, I see Bob so on the call, Bob Flynn, and we are so thankful for their hard work at Nissan Stadium. It's important to our success uh, that they got it right, and as Bark said, uh, they didn't just do it right, they did it really well. And, uh, and I think that's helping us as we have conversations with Hugh and, and different folks with the health department that, uh, that they can see that outside events can be done and that uh, we're all professionals and, and uh, can do it the best in the country. And I'm so thankful for, for Burke and all the effort there at Nis Burke and his team with uh, Nissan Stadium. Uh, I saw a report that came out that we have just hit 500 days since our last home game. Uh, so it's been a long journey for us. And uh, the good thing is we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we think that there's a pretty good reason to be optimistic that we could start our season in April. Uh, we've been very proactive in, in trying to maintain uh, that momentum that the Sun Stadium's kind of created for us. Um, so the... Uh, I think similar to the Preds, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of those same initiatives that they talked about, a lot of the same things that uh, Nissan Stadium did. We thought that we were going to be the first ones to uh, come out with the cashless uh, option here in in Nashville. Uh, so we have plans to to go cashless this year, uh, really eliminate some of those contact points and, and be aggressive and just providing that good, safe environment for the fans. So. Uh, the Preds beat us to it, but we'll uh, follow suit and uh, be ready to go. Um, as mentioned, we think April should start, so that would be a full 144-game season, uh, 72 games here at the ballpark. They play 144 games in 150 days, so it's a, uh, it's a journey as a minor league baseball guy, but uh, we're excited to try to get those games in. I think a lot of it's going to be dictated on when spring training starts. So they're telling us that as soon as Major League Baseball starts, we will have AAA join them. Double uh, A and below will start following that. So uh, the rest of minor league baseball will probably be delayed quite a bit. Um, but luckily at the AAA level, uh, we should be starting as soon as Major League Baseball does. So hopefully in the next month, uh, we'll have better direction on knowing if we start in April or, or if it gets pushed back at all. Um, not sure if we have mentioned this in a previous call, but uh, over the last month or so, we've had a transition to uh, become a Brewers affiliate. Uh, we were in the middle of a four-year agreement with the Texas Rangers uh, that had plans to be much longer than that, but uh, Major League Baseball took over minor league baseball operations back in October and with that, they changed our affiliate up and, and a lot of it was for geographical reasons. Uh, somehow Milwaukee and Nashville work. And uh, so we're in, in the process of signing a deal with the Brewers that would uh, have them here for 10 years. Um, so it looks like uh, there won't be many more changes on that front uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but we're really optimistic about this partnership with Major League Baseball. Uh, they're gonna be taken over the governing body for us. So there's going to be uh, some tremendous opportunity for us uh, in some different categories that minor league baseball uh, 
governing our operations and just didn't offer us. So uh, excited to see what happens there. Uh, finally, a new initiative that we have going right now and, and uh, we just started last week was a, an initiative called Work From Home Plate. Uh, so the concept is that you can rent out one of our suites for the day and, and get your work done. And kind of an idea of just throwing things against the wall and uh, we announced it and almost sold out immediately. There's very limited availability and and just a good way to to kind of continue to give back to the community and do something unique and fun. Um, and people that are renting out our suites are are just enjoying the atmosphere, the the view. Uh, we got one of the best views in all of sports. Looking back at downtown Nashville, so um, excited to try it. And it's not a huge money maker for us, but it uh, it's just a fun way to again give back. I think the last thing I would say before I pass it on to Doug is um, that our mission is to constantly improve every aspect of the fan experience. And we have been planning for 500 days now, uh, a lot of really cool things um, for that fan experience. And, and even if we have restrictions, even if we have uh, anything come up, uh, that is gonna be our main thing is, is we will not compromise uh, that fan experience and, and it's going to continue to be the best around and uh, and we're excited for 2021 and uh, to get things going. So a couple updates from Doug on the health department and tornado damage that I'll pass over to him. Doug, are you still on the line? Adam, we appreciate I'll run it. over to him and tell him to get off. Okay, hey, um, thank you for the, the update though. And um, we'll, we'll kind of continue to move through the agenda if possible. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think his update was, was pretty brief. So no worries. Well, we um, appreciate, we know it's been a challenging year for everyone and, and look forward to being back at the ballpark as well. Um, I know, and thank you everybody for being patient. I know we went through- Can you all hear me? There we go. There we go. I had a double mute setting and I apologize for that. Um, Kim, I, I, will be, I will be brief here. Um, this is Doug Scopel, Vice President of Operations for the Sound. Um, Adam kind of covered a lot of the health. I, I did want to thank uh, Bob and the Titans and also David Kells at the Preds. Um, both of them have been tremendously helpful to us as we plan ahead for we, what we hope will be a real successful season. Um, we're still working through a lot of our protocols with the health department, with some oversight from Major League Baseball. We hope uh, sometime in the, within the next month that we'll have a lot more information that we can share about what our 2021 season will look like here at First Horizon Park. Um, our, I think I've mentioned on previous calls, but wanted to tell this body again, all of the tornado damage we sustained, I feel like it was a long, long time ago, but 10 months ago, that is all fully repaired, fully paid. So we are we are back made whole on that. And I pre there's a lot of people involved with that. And one other cool historical note, if if nothing else, uh, recently you you guys may have seen. I think in November, Metro Council uh, passed some. Uh, I don't know what the word is for it, a um, uh, resolution or whatever, to rename Fifth Avenue North after um, John Lewis. Though I don't need to tell all you guys his history, but very famous uh, person uh, who passed away recently. Um, so the ballpark is now going to be located on the corner of Representative John Lewis Way and Junior Gilliam Way, two very important historical people um, to this neighborhood that we're in and we're proud to be in. I just wanted to mention that footnote that we're, that adds to more of the, the history that we try to celebrate every day here at our ballpark. Thank you, Doug. Um, I did not realize the street uh, change and, and that's tremendous. And um, thank you for, for your update. We appreciate everybody hanging in and I know we try to focus on one venue per meeting, but um, given the fact that uh, a lot has happened, uh, this has been a year of adjustments and um, there has been uh, a lot of challenges thrown our way and, um, and we have pivoted and adjusted by doing tremendous things in the community at our venues. And we thought it was important to, to highlight those, um, to start off 
our January meeting. Are there any questions for the sounds or can we move on to the next agenda item? Okay, hearing none, that will bring us to our 2021 board elections. Each January, the authority holds an election for officers of chair, vice chair, secretary, and in your materials on Friday, you should have received a memo that explains the process for our annual officer elections. Nominations will be taken from the floor either as a slate or for individual positions. And nominations do not require a second. I just wanna say, um, take a moment, if you would, to tell the board it has been such an honor to serve as the chair of this body. And I served in this role much longer than anticipated. I realize there's a game clock and it doesn't go on forever and it's time for a new season. Maintaining and improving our professional sports facilities in Nashville is the Sports Authority's mission. Our facilities are very important to our city and our state, much more than just to the teams and the fans that get to use them. I think we all know that there are important reflections in Nashville and unite us all to rally around something that is much bigger, coming together as a community. Thank, thank you to everyone for the role that you've played in helping us achieve this mission. And um, I know we've hit on uh, several things this meeting, but I would like to take a moment and just reflect on some of our achievements together. Some of the good times. In 2019, Nashville was named best sports city by the Sports Business Journal. And in that same year, of course, we hosted the NFL draft shattering attendance records. We have built Ford Ice Centers, bringing hockey to more children and families. And in 2017, Bridgestone Arena and the Predators hosted the Stanley Cup playoffs. And that same year, ESPN named them as the best sports franchise of all of professional sports. In 2017 and 2019, Bridgestone Arena was named Venue of the Year by the Country Music Association. And in 2015, we did something pretty spectacular. We hired Monica Faknatson as our full-time executive director, the first African-American woman to hold this position. We also opened First Tennessee, which is now First Horizon Park, in 2015 and in 2019 they hosted 23 sellouts the most in a season, single season and hosted the most ever total events in the park that same year the ballpark also had a big role in setting the stage for bringing soccer and by sharing their facility with the usl team in 2018 and 2019 and now major league soccer is in nashville and the titans organization is sharing Nissan Stadium with our new MLS team. And of course, our new stadium is under construction. We have all achieved these milestones together and we certainly have much more to do together. And no doubt that we won't let up and I know we will. So at this time, I would like to nominate a slate of candidates for our officers elections that would include Chair Kathy Bender, Vice Chair Frank Harrison and Secretary Emmett Wynn. I believe they would make an exceptional executive committee and would each serve in these roles with distinctions. Distinction. Are there any other nominations from the floor? Or any comments? Kim, th this is Glenn Farner. I, I, I have a comment or a question, not necessarily uh, uh, objecting to it, whatever. What What is the process for these elections? Like, I think you showed some bylaws there a second ago or something. Is Do we do that by slate? Do we do that by individual office? What's Maybe that's more of the... I think Margaret Darby can answer that question, but um, essentially we... <laughs> We I'm just unfamiliar with it because, you know, I'm relatively new, so. 
I think our bylaws and, and Margaret Darby can chime in call for officers elections in January. You can either nominate by slate or individual offices. Darby? Uh, yeah, that's exactly correct, Chair. Um, you can uh, nominate in either or uh, fashion. So a slate can, of officers can be nominated. That does not preclude individual nominations from being made also from the floor. So anyone can nominate anybody for any position. Okay, <laughs> I, just, I, just, I wasn't sure what the, the process was. I was just trying to read it. It's real small on my screen, so. It was part of the packet that was emailed by Monica, um, I believe last week. Yeah, it was on Friday. Okay, thank you. That's all the question I have. Okay, we have um, a nomination out there. Are there others or do we want to comments? Kim, this is Margaret. Uh, if there are no more nominations, I move that the nomination cease and that we vote by acclamation the slate that you proposed. This is Glenn. I'll, I'll second the motion. This is Margaret Darby, and I have one just point to make that we uh, unfortunately because we're meeting over WebEx, we can't have a vote by acclamation. It'll need to be a roll call vote. And I apologize for that little technicality. That's a, I think if we're used to it, Margaret, yes. I can, um, I'll, if I can run through uh, members and, and ask you how you vote, I'll, if there are any other, um, all right, we are ready to go, let me find my list. Uh, we will start with Kathy Bender. I just got a text from her that she fell off, so I, I think she'll try to get back on. Okay. Emmett Wynn? Margaret Bim? Aye. Don Deering? Aye. Glenn Parner? Aye. Melvin Gill? Yes. John Glassmeyer? Yes. Frank Harrison? Aye. Dan Hogan? Aye. Aaron McGee? Aaron must have dropped off. Um, but I certainly have it in the uh, new slate of executive committee is approved. Madam Chair, this is Frank Harris. Yes. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much for the service that you rendered to the Sports Authority uh, in your tenure, and uh, glad you're still going to be with us, but uh, appreciate it very much having you as a chair. Uh, you did a remarkable job. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Kim, can I be recognized? <laughs> yes, ma'am. That was a wonderful statement and a wonderful look back at what you have done to lead this authority for the past few years. Has it been five years, six years? How long has it been? Five, six? I think five. Six. Six. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think probably Kathy and Emmett and I were the board members that were on the board when you assumed the leadership. And I just want to tell you um, how much I approve, really appreciate your steady, capable leadership. Um, you've been the face of the Sports Authority along with Monica, and you have represented us so well, and you have served on many committees as chair of the Sports Authority. You have signed numerous, numerous documents. 
as our chair. And I think most importantly, you've been an avid and fan and you have attended so many uh, sports events, particularly uh, the teams in our facility. And I just want to thank you so much for your leadership and your public service. And I'm so glad that you would still be on the board. Well, thank you. I truly believe we've we've done a lot together and I've just had the privilege to um, get to work with everyone and, and uh, certainly um, remain committed to uh, the good work of this body and um, continue to serve, but certainly understand it is, uh, I don't know how it's been five or six years, I'm not really sure. Um, and this past year has uh, definitely been an adventure for all of us, um, but it is. it has been an honor and uh, I look forward to continuing to work with everyone. So thank you so much. Madam Chair, could you hear me? Oh, we can hear and see you, Emmett, hi. Oh, you can see me too. Get rid of that. <laughs> I just wanted to say that uh, the fact that you're moving to a different position, you know, we think that you have done an outstanding job. And I do, uh, since I wasn't able to vote on the slate, I would like to say that if it's the, if it's the uh, affirmative of the group, I will stay in my job until someone makes a different choice. And you just make sure you hang around us. We wouldn't have it any other way, Emmett. Thank you so much. Madam Chair? Yes. Oh, Hi. Uh, I am back on the call. I'm sorry I dropped off. Um, well, I wanted to acknowledge your contribution to the authority. And I see that Martha, uh, Margaret put... Um, put the words out there. I mean, you've been a great leader um, and your commitment to this authority goes without saying. Um, I am grateful for the opportunity to follow in your footsteps. And I, I know that you will stay close by and um, I will definitely reach out to you for some guidance. So um, you're not getting away from us. Uh, we're gonna keep you close and make sure that you continue to contribute to this authority. And I'd also just like to say thank you to the board for entrusting me to serve as chair of this body. The work we, that we do is so vitally important to the citizens in the city of Nashville. And I look forward to serving in my new capacity. And uh, thanks again, Madam Chair, for all that you do. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kathy. I am. Um... Madam Chair? Yes. Melvin Gill. Uh, as one of the newest members, uh, I haven't had the pleasure of working with you for a long time, but uh, I want you to know that I truly appreciated your support and the time that you spent with me during the confirmation hearing. Uh, that was very supportive, and hopefully all of the chairs going forward would, will do the same thing for all new members. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, I also real quickly just want to say thank you, Kim. It has been um, it has been wonderful serving with you over the last five years, and you have made us um, all better. You've made the board better. Um, your support, not just for me and and the staff, but um, you know, as as Mark said, for our teams and our facilities, for the administration, for everything, has just you've been just very consistent and steady and supportive. Um, over over years that have um, have brought us all kinds of surprises and um, and and so we are we are thankful and we're glad that we still have some more time with you so thank you for everything. Thank you guys appreciate uh, those nice comments I'm not sure they're justified but um, thank you so much I, I believe this does conclude our agenda today and um, thank you to the members of the board sports authority staff Metro legal facility and team representatives and project managers for hanging in there and attending today's lengthy meeting. Our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, February 18th. I believe there will also be a finance committee meeting in advance of that. And uh, staff will reach out uh, to confirm uh, those details. And uh, again, thank you all for the opportunity to serve with you and uh, look forward to being with you in a different capacity, but uh, still with you next uh, at the next meeting and future meetings to come. So if there's no other business, I would entertain a motion to adjourn.
So moved, Frank Harrison. Thank you, Frank. We are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.